there are even more radical findings. So people have shown, I'm skipping all the details because I just didn't have time to squish it into this lecture. But you can, using some kind of fancy analysis methods, you can use with functional MRI, you can show a version of a grid-like representation of not just space and time, but very abstract conceptual spaces. So in one experiment, oops, all my pop-ups are coming in the wrong order, never mind. In one experiment, they taught people different kinds of birds. And the birds could vary in the length of their legs and the length of their necks. Okay, so people had to learn that a different little object was associated with each of these different birds, okay, that varied in these two dimensions. So they didn't tell subjects we're teaching you a two-dimensional space. They just said you have to learn that this bird goes with that and this one goes with this and so forth. Okay? So, but essentially the space they're teaching them is it actually can be mapped onto two-dimensional space where each of the associated objects is related to a bird with different neck length and leg length. So this is a very abstract, totally, you know, weird, confected conceptual space that the subjects are taught that has this underlying two dimensions. They're not even taught that it has two dimensions, they're just taught this stuff that if you encoded it in MATLAB and did PCA on it, you'd discover there were two dimensions, right? Um, okay, so what they then show is that after subjects learn this, they do all this with a lot of training outside the scanner. You then scan them um, doing simple tasks on these birds where they have to figure out which goes with which. And you can show a kind of neural echo of a grid-like representation. Okay, now if you're thinking, how the hell would you do that with functional MRI? That's a good question. It's actually pretty tricky. The gist of the idea is remember those grids have a very particular orientation. And all the cells in a grid representation are aligned with the same hexagonal axes, even though they're different faces, okay, in a whole region of brain. And so if you think about it, in a, in a grid arrangement, there are some axes that are privileged, which means that lots of different subfields land on top of that axis more than this axis. So you basically have uh, people move around in this bird space, and what you find is that some axes in bird space produce higher hippocampal responses because they're aligned with a hexagonal grid and others are not. If I just lost you, don't worry about it. I was trying to give you the gist and it probably didn't make any sense. Anyway, it's a, it's a way to use functional MRI to get a kind of echo of a grid-like representation and they found this after teaching people these very abstract, non-spatial, non-temporal, conceptual space. Isn't that awesome? And you find these grid-like representations not just in entorhinal cortex, but in multiple regions of the brain, including in a lot of cortical regions, okay? So that suggests that this whole grid idea might be about representing two-dimensional um, spaces, not just spatial spaces, but conceptual spaces. Any kind of two-dimensional information that you represent might make use of a grid-like representation, okay? Um, okay, another one, they, <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is really wacky. Uh, they taught people, they had people engage in virtual social interactions in which the people they were interacting with treated them in different ways with, that gave them information both about the power that person had over them and um, how, um, and how uh, personally close they were to that person, okay? Social dimensions that people might care about in, in, in social cognition. And they found that hippocampal cells um, reflected you could predict with hippocampal cells both the person's perception of the um, social distance and the power that person had over them from hippocampal play cells. Pretty wild, right? Uh, or from hippocampal cells. This is with MRI. Ah, yes. What about the bat that navigates in uh, three dimensions? Okay. Well, not only do the play cells operate in three dimensions, but those play cells get repurposed for social cognition. So I'm going to skip over the details because I'm almost out of time. time. But what, you, what, they, what was published just a few months ago um, is the fact that there are place cells in the bat hippocampus that respond not just to where I am right now, me, this bat, but where my friend Joe Bat is right now. They're social place cells. Isn't that cool? Okay, they don't have the same place field for me and for you, but there's place fields in the same cell for me and for you that are just not corresponding. So that's pretty awesome. That's another repurposing of your navigational machinery to subserve other aspects of cognition. But in some ways, the coolest thing um, is, is, a, is actually an older paper 
that shows that um, place cells are used not just for representing space or concepts or social structures, but for thinking. Okay, so I'm going to show you. This is a case where these guys had rats running in mazes, kind of like this. They recorded from a bunch of hippocampal place cells at once, and they used that information in ways I won't detail to just take, you can imagine how you would do it. You're recording from a bunch of place cells. You could read out the location of that animal. Everybody get, does that seem intuitive? Like you could do some math, machine learning, whatever, on the response, and you'd know where is that animal right now. Okay, so they did that. And so here is uh, a, a rat in this maze. The white circle is where the rat is, and this is where his place cell readout says he is. Okay, decent correspondence. Okay, so now what they do is they ask what happens when this rat, uh, this is actually the shape of the maze. Okay, when the rat comes up to here, he has a choice. He can go that way or that way. He has to make a decision. How does he think about that decision? Let's watch him think about that decision. Okay. So what you're going to see is a movie of the readout from his place cells of where he is. The white dot is where he actually is. The color is the place cell readout. Okay, so he's moving up here and the place cells track his location. Now he's here, he's deciding which way to go. Oh, I wonder where he's, what he's considering. Is he thinking about going that way? Now he's thinking about going this way. He's deliberating. He's thinking, oh, and then he goes there and the place cells go there. So it's like we are seeing the neural correlate of his deliberation. He's sitting there thinking, huh, what if I went this way? And the place cells go that and check it out. What if I went that way? And the place cells go that way. So it looks like you can use these cells not just to represent your current location, but to consider future possibilities.